Welcome to the newest episode of Beyond the Fame with Jason Fraley. I'm your host, Jason Fraley, picking the brains of the top filmmakers, musicians, and artists of our time. Grammy winner Richard Marks performs live at the Capitol Turnaround in Washington, D.C. tomorrow night. He called in to discuss his biggest hits from Don't Mean Nothing to Right Here Waiting, as well as songs he wrote for other artists like This I Promise You for NSYNC, Dance With My Father with Luther Vandross, and Better Life for Keith Urban. Hey, Richard Marks. Hey, thanks so much for joining us on WTOP in DC. Hey, man. How are you? Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. I'm doing good. This is an honor. You know, like a lot of us, we grew up listening to your stuff. So this is you're like the soundtrack of our lives in a lot of ways. So this so is a you real. Start, you're starting the interview by calling me old. I get it. No, that's okay. <laughs> no, or, call, or calling me young. Let's meet in the middle. <laughs> it's classic stuff. All, all the Thank same. Um, we're, we're, we're talking because you're coming to the Capitol Turnaround tomorrow for a show. I think it's co-presented by Union Stage. Um, it's it's going to be awesome here in D.C. So, uh, you know, what what can we expect? Is, is it all the greatest hits? Anything off, you know, the newer albums, Limitless, Songwriter, a little of both? Well, normally it's, you know, mostly the hits. But I thought for you guys, for D.C., I would do the entire show is going to be songs that I wrote that I didn't think were good enough to actually be on albums. That's the whole set list. Just really lame <laughs> no, of course. Thanks for thanks be, for we'll call it the scraping the bottom of the barrel. Scraping tour, right? the bottom of the barrel, the bottom drawer <laughs> tour. Um, no, I've I've always historically focused on the hits because I get it. I go to concerts too. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear the songs that I know. Mm -hmm. I do think it's always important. I always have a couple of songs in the show, whether I have a new album out or not, that uh, are not radio songs, but that are either deeper cuts or maybe something that I haven't even recorded yet that I just wrote um, because I think it's, you know, I mean, I, it's such a segue to the name of my new album songwriter, but that's really the most important part of what I do. I think of myself as a songwriter more than anything else. And so I want to share songs with people, but what I've noticed on this tour and we're coming, we're coming into the last 10 days of it is when I've been playing, I, I only do a, a few songs from the new album. The rest of the show's just hits. Okay. Um, but when I've done the new songs night after night after night, starting in Europe, um, the reaction to the new songs has been overwhelming, has been so inspiring for me. And um, these, you know, like these audiences are responding to these songs like their greatest hits. So that is inspiring. That's one of the reasons that keeps me writing songs, you know, to get a reaction like that. Well, there you go. They're responding like the greatest hits. So you could always put out another greatest hits and add the new ones on there. You hey, do whatever we want, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's awesome. So, yeah, there's so many hits that everyone will, you know, recognize when, when they come to your show. But uh, whenever I have someone like yourself on, I always sort of, I love to hear sort of your origin story, how you got into it in the first place. So I know you were born in what, in 63 in Chicago, but was is it true your, your dad wrote jingles? Is, is that the connection to music or what was it? Well, yeah, the initial connection to music was my parents. My, so my father was a jazz pianist, very successful in Chicago, um, and had a great career at that in his uh, 20s and 30s. And then in his mid 30s, he kind of switched gears and became a jingle composer, producer, arranger. And it was sort of like the beginning of that heyday of commercial jingles, where, you know, jingles were as big a part of pop culture as hit songs. And yeah, my father just had this incredible knack for creating 30 second hits. You know, he just knew how to write a hook and didn't write the lyrics. That was all given to him by the advertising people, but he would write these really catchy melodies to these ridiculous lyrics. <laughs> um, and my mother, who was a big band singer before she met my father, became, you know, one of his go to vocalists on the commercials. And then when I was old enough to start singing on commercials for, candy bars and breakfast cereals and stuff like that. They had me coming into the studio and singing. So I grew up in the recording studio, um, but they, you know, it's, it's hard to explain to a lay person, but the, even though it's music, the commercial jingle world is an entirely different planet than the record business. So I, even though I grew up in music, I didn't have any ins in, term, in terms of the record industry. So I had to sort of start from scratch and I just got lucky really early on. I, my first handful of songs, I made a demo tape of them. And within a year, they found somehow found their way to Lionel Richie. And he was just starting his solo career. And nice. he really kind of got behind me and was really encouraging me and encouraged me to move out to L.A. and kind of try it out there when I was about 18 or 19. And then he had me singing background vocals on some of his solo records. And so Lionel was sort of like this 
guardian angel who sort of took my hand and, and helped me get into the business. Wow. So yeah, that's cool. Thanks for sharing that. A lot of people might not know that, yeah. that Lionel Richie was the sort of the helping hand that got you Dude, in. Next time, it. next time you play or hear all night long and you hear Lionel go all night long, all night. That's me. You're all night. All night. I'm doing, that's me. That is you. You're all night. Really? If that doesn't impress people, I don't know what will. I mean, just, we can end the interview now. That That's it. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I'm not going to no. tell that. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, we're going to try. All right. Yeah, so we'll try. not only Lionel Richie, all right, he, he takes a liking to you. You start singing there. Um, don't you also, and we're here in your, we're still in this whole, you know, early days before Richard Marks becomes the Richard Marks. Um, in the early eighties, didn't you write um, a couple songs for Kenny Rogers? What about me crazy um even even some saint elmo's fire stuff uh, playing on that soundtrack too yeah i did a bunch of studio work i did a lot of writing um before i had a record deal i wrote songs for kenny rogers that were a couple of those were really big hits um crazy and what about me mm-hmm. um and that was by the way that was another connection to lionel because lionel is the one who introduced me to kenny his buddy kenny rogers and that's how that happened right uh, and then i started just getting work as a background singer, musician, songwriter, and I got to work with Philip Bailey of Earth, Wind and & Fire, and I, I did write a song on St. Elmo's Fire with uh, David Foster, the producer, um, and I just started you know, doing a lot of background vocal work on everybody from Madonna to The Tubes to Julio Iglesias. <laughs> like I sang on so many other yeah. people's records, and this was all in the three or four years before I got a record deal. That's so cool. I love that because that means us as the public, we were starting to, it was starting to percolate. We were hearing your voice and, and songs, even if we didn't truly know it, you know, we yeah, were that's true. appreciating that's right. your artistry. And that's then true. boom, uh, finally you get to take center stage um, in your, your self-titled debut album there, Richard Marks in, in 87. Gosh. So what is it? Is that 35th anniversary? Is that my math? Yeah. Right? Wow. That's crazy. Um, yeah. So tell me about putting together that first one, obviously um, hold on to the nights, endless summer nights, but the big one with the Grammy nod, I think was uh, don't mean nothing that a lot of us will yeah. remember that, but uh, just take me into the putting together that first album. That must've been a whirlwind uh, getting to do it for your, your own uh, you know, for your own album, as opposed to these other people we mentioned. Yeah. Well, I mean, <sighs> I didn't have tremendous uh, expectations, really. I just hoped that I would sell enough records to make another album. You know, you, what you don't want is to put out a record that just completely tanks and you get dropped and then you're back to square one. Yeah. I just hoped that I could, you know, squeeze a hit out of it, sell enough records that the label would let me make another record. I thought it would just sort of be a gradual incline. But the first single, Don't Mean Nothing, was so accepted at rock radio and then it crossed over to pop radio um, partly due to the presence of three of the eagles that were on that song randy meisner and timothy schmidt sang background vocals joe walsh played the guitar solo wow. so it almost sounded like an eagles record where we hadn't had an eagles record in about eight years right so this so is I, before they reunited or whatever yeah right? so i i know that that was a component to it MTV was really supportive from the get go. And sort of like before I knew it, it was just sort of like this overnight. It was everything was on fire. And then we had four big hits from the first album. We sold millions of records. And then I only I toured for 15 months on that album or something like that. So I I really wanted to be known as a live performer. And then I had a brief six months to make the second album, Repeat Offender. I was right back in the studio and then right back out on tour. and. It just kept going, you know, but it was it was a, a whirlwind for sure. But it was really exciting, really exciting time. Wow, I didn't realize you only had, what, six months, you said, to put together the second one? So I guess yeah. after you have a big hit like that, they're like, all right, come on, come on, get back in here. We need more. Well, not only that, but it had been two years since I'd put the album out. You know, I right. toured behind that album True. for a good two years. Right, right. Well, awesome. Well, um, we're glad that, you know, you're off to the races at that point. And then that second album, um, another Grammy nomination for probably your quote career song that everyone knows you from is is right here waiting, you know, wherever yeah. you um, h- How, I mean, A, you, you wrote that yourself. So do you remember where you were? I love finding, hearing those stories of either where you were or what inspired, you know, you, you putting pen to paper on that actual one. Cause it's, it's lyrics that you could set, you could go to the airport or some random stranger on the street and you say, wherever you go. And then they'll finish the lyric. Everybody knows. Yeah. That. It's pretty amazing. Uh, it's funny because I wrote that song in my friend's garage. We were writing a rock song, like a heavy, like arena rock song. And 
he took a break. His name is Bruce Geich, great guitar player, co-writer. He, he and I wrote Don't Mean Nothing together. And we've been friends since I was a kid. And he took a break to go into his house to make a phone call. And I was sitting in his garage and there was a little electric piano sitting there. And I sat down and I wrote Right Here Waiting in 15 minutes or something like that. It was like the easiest song I ever wrote. About I waiting was, for him to come back to the garage? It was not about Bruce waiting. That that would that would make sense, actually. I'm right here waiting to finish our rock song. Would have not been as romantic a lyric. Um, I was dating uh, uh, the woman who was my first wife, Cynthia. And she was an actress. And so she was in Africa making a film. And I was touring and there was just this months and months. And this is before FaceTime or the internet or anything like that. Um, I was just really bummed out. I just was uh, feeling down and missing her. And so I just wrote this is basically a, a a letter to her. Now, I had no intention of recording it. It didn't really fit. I didn't think it fit the Repeat Offender album because the Repeat Offender album was more of a rock album. And I tried to give that song away to Barbara Streisand, who had asked me to write a song for her around the same time. And she, uh, it's a pretty well-known story now, but she called me upon hearing the, the demo and said that she loved the music, but she needed me to rewrite the lyrics because she said, I'm not going to be right here waiting for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> they wait for me. <laughs> but then it then it was sort of like this series of people, friends of mine and yeah. people I worked with who would have heard the demo and they were like, you're an idiot if you don't put this on this album. This is like a one listen. This is a smash song. I've never under, I've never known that. I've never written a song I knew I thought it was a hit. I just write songs I like, you know? Right, right. Um, but that song definitely changed my life for sure. Oh, it changed a lot of lives. I, I mean, seriously, yeah. I mean, uh, every I'm, it's probably how how many how many Valentines or even wedding dances. You know what I yeah. mean? It, it's crazy how many people it, you, your your music has touched. Now, well, when people tell me that they used my song at their wedding, I always ask, "You mean should have known better?" <laughs> <laughs> crazy <laughs> <laughs> hazard. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you're 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 we're, we're name dropping titles here, but you have had you mean satisfied. Keep coming back. There's been so many over the years. Um, and we'd be here all day if we talked about them all. But I do. Um, if you if you don't mind, I would like to remind listeners some of the songs. Uh, in addition to your own stuff that you wrote for other artists, like you know, even even in you know in the new millennium, let's say. So like yeah. a lot a lot of uh millennials probably. Uh, played in syncs. This I promise you, and had no idea that that you were the one that wrote it. Right? Did they come to you, or was it vice versa? How did that work? Yeah, they the, their label came to me, and I wrote and produced this. I promise you for Instinct, and I, so I worked with them in the studio, and loved every second of it. They were such great guys, total pros. No shock at all that Justin Timberlake blew up because he was his work ethic even then when he was a kid was just unreal. So you could uh, you could tell even in the boy band. Days, I knew was, yeah. I could tell. I thought J.C. Chasse would become a huge star as well. And I think it's just priorities and and just different um, different career paths and stuff like that. But it was no question for me that Justin was going to be a superstar. Awesome. And yes, but yeah, I, I did uh, do that song. I wrote and produced that song. Did you have a similar... Um inkling about when you because didn't you also write to where you are for josh groban and did you know yes. you, you, so we can say you helped launch timberlake and josh groban <laughs> uh, you, we could say that it would be a lie but we could say it uh jo the josh thing was just such a surprise because he was just this kid with this gigantic opera voice coming out of this skinny little body and um it was fun for me because I wrote to where you are with, I wrote the music and my friend Linda Thompson wrote the lyrics and I produced it, but it was really fun for me to try to sort of get pseudo classical with that music. And I wrote chord changes I'd never used before. And I, it was really fun for me as a musician and as a producer and arranger. Um, but I, if you told me in the year 2001, that this 19, 20 year old kid was going to become a superstar with an opera voice, I would have said, <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So to me, it was sort of like just a fun project to do. And the next thing I knew, it was number one. It was huge. And he's done. He's kicked ass ever since. Totally, totally. Well, we'd be re thanks for sharing all the stories. But uh, we'd be remiss if we don't mention, um, you know, the big Grammy winning. I guess it was was it song of the year. Dance with my father. Yeah. The one you did with Luther Vandross. Um, man, yeah. talk about a 
Woo, that's a that's a tearjerker of a song in, in 2003. I guess you wrote, co-wrote that. But um, tell me about putting that together with Luther. What, uh, did he sort of have the initial uh, seeds of that or did you have it and come to him or vice versa? What was it? Uh, the For Dance With My Father, he had the title. He brought the title to me and said, we have to write a song with this title. We'd already written songs together that he'd recorded over the years. And we were really close friends. He was one of my closest friends. Yeah. And we spent a lot of time just hanging out and laughing together. And um, when we wrote together, it's interesting. He's the only co-writer. I think he's the only co-writer in my life who, especially given that we were close, such close friends, we never wrote a song together in the same room. Wow. I would write a piece of music and then he would write lyrics to it. Um, in this, And this was the case with Dance With My Father as well. So he told me the title. He kind of gave me an idea of what he wanted the song to say. I and went his dad off just and, died. His father just passed, or no? He, he his father passed when he was like twelve. Okay, and I think it was more. He came to me particularly with that song because well, my father died very suddenly when I was thirty three in nineteen ninety seven, hmm. and Luther was one of the few people that just sort of knew how to carry me through that grief and wow. help me through it. And I was really close to my dad, and so I think it was through that through him helping me through that that made him think i have to write this with richard um i wrote the music pretty quickly he sent me back this amazing lyric the next day we both tweaked little bits of it and he went in and recorded it and i think it was like 10 days after he mixed it that he had the stroke and he lived i think another year or something like that i did go visit him a couple times and i got to see him he, he did see the grammy win and he was so excited about that but he was just in such bad shape. It was heartbreaking. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I miss him every day. Luther Vandross was just, he was not only one of the greatest voices the world has ever heard, but he was just the sweetest, funniest, coolest dude. I miss him terribly. Oh, that's so great to hear, you know, because yeah, I agree, all all timer voice and just yeah. the catalog is amazing, but it's so nice yeah. to hear hear the personal, uh, you know. Yeah, he was great. You have for him. Um, well, that's great. I mean, and, and it's cool you guys got to do that and, uh, you know, pay tribute not only to his father, but help walk you through your own grief of your your yeah. dad. Man, that must be every time you hear that song, that must bring tears to the eyes. Uh, wow. I'm yeah, choking up I, just thinking about it. I stopped. I didn't uh, for years. I didn't ever sing it live because it felt wrong for me. I don't I don't know mm. why. I think it was still I was still sort of mourning Luther and I just felt like that was so his stamp and his song. And it always felt wrong to me to because people would ask me to sing it and I kept saying no I can't do that song and then about six years or seven years after Luther passed I just realized I have to do this song I have to do this song all the time I have to keep his memory alive I have to keep this song in the world I have to and so I do it um I might do it tomorrow night you know and a lot of times people yell it out during the show and I'll just run to the piano and do it but I've performed it now hundreds of times and I do it in tribute to him Wow. Yes. Do it tomorrow night at Capital Turnaround if you can. Okay. We, we would love to hear that. We would love to hear that. T -O -W -T -O -P request line, please. <laughs> okay. uh, that's so great. That's so great. Um, well, you've been more than generous with your time. We could, I mean, there's so many, I mean, you wrote, uh, maybe actually really quick time for more. Didn't you do Keith Urban, uh, Long Hot Summer? Uh, what was it like working with Keith? He, he's got, the guy can shred and he can sing and he's a power. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's amazing. One of the best live performers out there makes great records. Um, we met in the early 2000s. We really just were put together by somebody in Nashville, like a publisher or something. And we just clicked. We hit it off and we wrote um, a song called Better Life that was huge number one for him on the country charts. Oh, yeah. He headed for a better life. Yeah. 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 We that, one. yeah. that was ours. And then we wrote another song a couple of years later called Everybody that was top five single for him. And then in I think it was 2011 or 2012, we wrote Long Hot Summer, which was also number one. So we're three for three. We haven't written together in a while, but there's actually a song on my new album, Songwriter, called One Day Longer that I wrote with Keith. So really? we we continue to collaborate, whether it's for him or me. Oh, that's really cool. It's coming back around the other way on, yeah. your, on your new album. Well, yeah. we encourage everyone to pick that up. Uh, the latest Richard Marks album, it's called Songwriter. I believe it just came out like last month or something like yeah. that. So. Yeah, yeah. So pick that up. But first, before any of that, come check him out tomorrow at the Capitol Turnaround in D.C., presented by Union Stage. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. This this was so much fun. Uh, you want to just end by uh, talk directly to the listeners and say, hey, come on out, everybody. It's going to be a, a good time. 
Well, I can't wait. I've heard nothing but great things about the venue. So come see me at the Capitol Turnaround. We're going to have a party that's going to be a party in your honor. I'm just going to be your humble host. We'll do a bunch of the hits, but we'll do whatever you want. When people yell out songs, especially the deep cuts, it's always so fun. It's a fun challenge to see if I can remember the lyrics. And it's just literally, it's like a party. So I hope everybody comes out. Awesome. So this, just to clarify, this is the greatest hits tour. We'll save the bottom of the barrel tour for another time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next time. maybe. <laughs> awesome. Hey, this was so much fun. Thanks, Richard Marks. I appreciate it. My pleasure, man. All right. Take care. You too. Thanks so much for listening to Beyond the Fame with Jason Fraley. Our theme music is Scott Buckley's Clarion. Remember to give us a five-star rating if you like what you hear. We'll see you next time. Explain your DNA on, on 10 cases, man. You're inside the police interrogation room with the alleged Potomac River rapist. I'm not guilty on any of this stuff. So calm, so reasonable. Could this be the man who terrorized women for nine years before murdering a brilliant scientist two decades ago? Experience one of the most fascinating true crime podcasts available. Join crime reporter Paul Wagner for Unknown Subject, season three of WTOP's American Nightmare series. Search American Nightmare Podcast on all podcast platforms. I wanted to take a second to tell you about an app I really enjoy. Living in the D.C. area is great, and Podcast D.C. gathers all of the local shows that I like all in one local app. Health, sports, local news, politics, and so much more. Podcast D.C. is the new local app with hundreds of D.C. area podcasts to choose from. I can earn exciting rewards just for listening and share the podcasts I love instantly. Available in the App Store or in Google Play, listen local with Podcast DC.